seconds. I welcome you all to the next session of our science leadership program. Today we have with us Dr. Yoko Shimpuku. Uh, professor Shimpuku is a professor at Hiroshima University in Japan, one of the well-known uh, university there. She is also the member of the Executive Council, uh, Executive Committee, the Global Young Academy. And uh, Professor Shimpuku is also a vice chair of Young Academy of Japan, one of the very prestigious academies in Japan. Uh, she has been serving there as the vice chair. And uh, uh, Professor Shimpuku is also a part of the science diplomacy work presented in the United Nations International Day of Women and Girls in Science Assembly in G7 Academy meeting. That is, a, you know, the, the group seven uh, top industrialist uh, countries of the world. So it is it's called G Science as well as in G20 Academy meeting. That is S20. So she, her actual achievement list of achievement is really too long. And of course, she has been working at the University of Tokyo. She's basically from uh, Tokyo. And Professor Shimpuku has been uh, doing a great job with, uh, uh, you know, the, the health leadership program in the University of Tokyo as well. And we are really happy to have you here, Madam. Uh, Professor, uh, along with me, uh, my co-moderator is uh, Dr. Manju. And uh, yes, Dr. Manju herself is a science leader. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much, Felix, for the nice introduction. I'm Yoko Simpuku from Japan. Now I'm sharing my PowerPoint slide. Here you go. So today I'm going to talk about my experience. It's um, basically my experience uh, from uh, about science leadership, what have I have been done, what I have been experiences, uh, and what I learned from my experiences. So a little bit about myself. I am a midwife by profession from Japan. I, uh, I worked in clinical for a while and I moved to Chicago for my PhD. Um, I got a PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I research um, maternal child health, especially in Africa. My field is uh, the country of Tanzania. And I am currently a professor in global health nursing at Hiroshima University. And as I'm introduced, I'm an uh, um, executive committee of GYA since 2018, and this is the third year as an executive committee. And this is uh, my second home, Chicago. My leadership endeavor started in Chicago when I was studying for my PhD. There are leadership courses available, and I took two, which taught me the concept of leadership, especially from the fields of business in the US, such as COVID-7 habits, 2080 theory, and such. And also in Chicago, I got so many opportunities, such as meeting diverse group of people and traveling to Africa with my supervisor. And the most important lesson learned at that time was to say yes, to any opportunity. Uh, don't limit your potentials yourself. You never know that the opportunity might change your life. Like traveling to Tanzania with my supervisor changed my life completely as research in Africa became part of my life. And now my mission for research is to create the environment where women living in any places can get access to the best care and give birth safely. When I got too busy and needed to select my work, I would select those which are close to this mission. 
And this mission came from my experience in PhD dissertation study. It's available online, so you may read more details in paper. But I want to share a little bit about my findings. What I found was that women who gave birth in rural Tanzania didn't get positive experiences at the hospital. Indeed, from late 90s, the international maternal health policy stated that they needed to focus on skilled birth attendants rather than traditional birth attendants, and that women should give birth at health facilities. But when the policymakers did not adjust uh, the number of hospitals and healthcare providers, hospital would become too crowded and not function properly. In many developing countries, especially in rural areas, I believe that it was what happened because the policies were not adjusted to the clinical conditions of rural sites. I believe part of it because uh, policymakers who grew up in urban areas never seen and know how deliveries in rural areas have been conducted. And they didn't even imagine how it'd be tiring and hard to assist one woman giving birth. Me as a midwife, I can tell delivering 10 to 15 babies per day with proper care and safe monitoring is impossible, but it was what midwives in the developing countries, especially in rural sites, were taught to do. And in many cases, they are doing so at this moment. So they are working very hard. And uh, when I interviewed mothers um, for my PhD dissertation, they told me uh, some gaps about the hospital care and the care they wanted to receive. Some of the example I'm showing is that uh, one said, I was calling the nurse, but she was not listening. I was, I was calling her to help me because the contractions were very strong. The nurse told me to wait while she was still walking around. When I was pushing, she told me if I didn't push, she would slap me on the cheek. What upset me was that habit of nurses passing around while I was calling for help. Maybe it'd be better to go to another hospital for another pregnancy. I just don't know. I don't even want to have a baby again because nobody would help me. So uh, this is what happened in Tanzania. Uh, so I wanted to uh, change the situation uh, using my research. And to influence policy by research, it is important to accumulate the research findings so that we can bring stronger voices to policymakers. My research was chosen as a review paper in two systematic review articles in the Journal of Social Science and Medicine and the Cochrane Library. I was very happy to contribute this movement and that it is very important to publish quality research papers so that your papers can give, can give strong inputs to the policy. And after a while, uh, WHO finally uh, published this statement. It's called the prevention and elimination of disrespect and abuse during uh, facility-based childbirth. I'd like to say that it is not only situations of Tanzania, but many developing countries. Um, WHO warned that it is a human rights issue, so it, it's important to eliminate disrespect and abuse. At that time, I, uh, as a member of WHO Collaborating Center, so I translated this statement into Japanese and just distributed this information to Japanese midwives. And the new WHO guideline came out very recently. Um, this, is a this is about pregnancy and childbirth, and it was published in 2016 and 2018. And uh, the publication, the title says, WHO recommendations on care for positive experience of women. So this means now it is a time when women are considered not only for physical survival, but in a holistic manner, including emotional and social conditions. 
I was very happy that my uh, research contributes to this uh, movement and WHO guidelines. And uh, my relationship with WHO started when I was a postdoc. I was enrolled in the Global Health Leadership Program in the University of Tokyo. I was, it was wonderful that all Japanese and international global health leaders joined as lecturers and told us their experiences and thoughts. We did a lot of group work and had funded intensive experiences outside Japan. What I learned was the um, lecture from a politician, Mr. Furukawa, on the photo. He told us, don't desire for more and more material or more money uh, or for, for yourself. Then you cannot be a leader. You serve for people who struggle more than you. And for my internship, I chose to come to India for WHO Sierra, located in New Delhi. I really enjoyed living in India. Um, I enjoyed uh, kingfisher beer and, and uh, colorful salis and spicy curry and everyday life was so colorful and very nice. I was surprised at that uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, they serve only a very spicy chicken, even if you don't say original chicken. It was very uh, surprising that uh, they give me only a spicy chicken. And it, I enjoyed uh, the different cultures a lot. And I was really lucky to have my supervisor, Dr. Prakin Sachaya. Uh, she's from Thailand. She's also a nurse midwife and she has been working in WHO for many years. And she also studied in the US, so she know what I want to talk about. And she told me that you need to, uh, uh, you may not criticize, but give advice and suggestions to others especially uh, from Japan and I experienced some uh, in Chicago. And when I traveled to Tanzania, I saw many um, severe cases of uh, uh, women, pregnant women and uh, nurses and midwives there to provide care. That's when, you know, in my feeling, I kind of wanted to criticize them, but uh, I also understand their situation, how tough they are doing uh, every, in an everyday basis. So it's better uh, not to criticize someone and you need to see from a bit far aside and give good suggestion and advice to them. And this is when I traveled to the field. Uh, this is the field of Timor Leste and Sri Lanka. And my supervisor, Dr. Plakin, listened to the nurses and midwives very carefully and gave advice and suggestion rather than telling them what to do. And those uh, nurses and midwives on the ground, they work very hard and they appreciate that uh, uh, Dr. Plakin really understood and provide the necessary care rather than like order or uh, telling what to do. And after I returned to Japan and became an assistant professor, I decided to develop my leadership by experiences. I started a project in NPO to support child education in Tanzania. The NPO is called New, uh, is called a class for everyone. And because a lot of uh, barriers for women to have a uh, safe deliveries related to poverty and lack of education, so to me, uh, not only encouraging women uh, already grown up, but also uh, educating girls and boys, they are still young, is really important to uh, improve the situation uh, for the long run. So I started a mobile library with health education so that children learn wide, widely and get their dreams to aspire for. My team fundraised through crowdfunding. This is a system that you can post your project and uh, many people can just donate uh, if your project is uh, good for them. So 
Uh, it was a great experience to strategize and inspire others so that others can donate. I kind of recommend fundraising experience for this reason if you want to develop your leadership. And I raised more than 3.6 million yen to buy a library car. And this is the library car we bought. We needed this kind of a very strong car so that they can run along the, uh, the rural sides, even in the mountain. And as we move further, many people think it is a good project. And now it became a JICA partnership project and received stable funding for this. And some uh, newspaper uh, wrote about us and they really enjoyed having our project in the field. I really enjoy teaching children in rural Tanzania as they're eager to learn new things and curious about everything. I believe it's important to use your leadership for what you enjoy and love. And another ongoing leadership experience is my uh, vice chair position at Young Academy of Japan. This is a part of the member of Young Academy of Japan. And uh, this is the current leadership of Young Academy of Japan. We have now 62 members as a group of young scientists in different disciplines, including arts and humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, formal sciences and applied sciences. And this is the structure of uh, Science Council of Japan. Young Academy of Japan uh, is a part of Senior Academy Science Council of Japan. And our membership uh, uh, term is up to six years and membership finishes at 45 years old. So they can start at any age, but they finish uh, when you reach the 45. And we have AGM like twice a year legally, but uh, according because of Corona, we uh, are postponing this year, but uh, uh, we also have a working group. So we uh, have some kind of activities uh, between the AGM. And the term of executive committee is three years. And this is my third year, that last year as an executive committee of a, a Young Academy of Japan. And uh, including me, the Global Young Academy members are currently four. And include alumni, we had uh, 11 members who had been GY members. And at this time, we are trying to connect science with the society by promoting citizen science. In 2018, we had a seminar in Tokyo and outreach at Hirosaki and Fukuoka. And our international network now have lots of activities, including GYA and other NYA members. Uh, in 2019, we had Tukuba conference and STS forum, for which in, we invited several GYM members and Almina for conference plenary and sessions. And now our activity with the GYA was reported in the GYA annual report in 2019 and received attention from global science community. I think you can find it on the website and GYA Twitter. Please uh, read uh, this article, it's quite nice. And uh, due to the activity with the network of Science Council of Japan, Young Academy of Japan members are assigned to important academic roles in Japan, including science advisor and committee members of ministries. I'm learning how and what to say at the meetings like ministries so that policymakers will take that into account. It is kind of science advice and it is good to learn from experiences as we scientists need to consider policymakers context. And this is uh, when I was dispatched to G7 Academy meeting in Paris in last year, it was March last year. And we discussed with the senior members 
The most of other members are senior academy presidents and Nobel laureates, so quite experienced uh, people. And we discuss how we should develop young scientists in each country and how uh, the voices of young scientists can be invo involved in and seriously considered in the high level meeting. And we continue to uh, discuss with this. And this year, we are also invited again to the meeting in US, but it was canceled due to Corona. But we gave input uh, to the statements. And statements are uh, every year, we, they are uh, bring to the uh, uh, decision makers in G7 uh, uh, countries. So it was important to put uh, in, uh, input from younger countries from young scientists. And in Japan, uh, if you were di dispatched to the G science, there was a uh, uh, like occasion to uh, like report the experience back to the prime minister. So it was a very uh, nice experience as, uh, as a like university professor, but at this age, you didn't kind of imagine that you give advice to prime minister. So uh, I, we lectured him and he received well, and it was a very good uh, experience to kind of uh, start uh, science advice at this uh, young age. And also there was a Tsukuba conference last year in October, and uh, there was a friendly session to discuss the future of science with Nobel laureates. And in the beginning, we were thinking it's better to receive lectures from Nobel laureates as they are more experienced, but we uh, kind of uh, uh, discuss that the young scientists also needs to discuss and also needs to give inputs to the science community. So we decided that we sit all together like circle and we discuss with the same topic so that uh, we young scientists and senior scientists can like, create the, like, a community uh, to improve the future of science together. And this is uh, kind of my activity to like give talk uh, in IFP and uh, uh, INSA and UN and AAAS. I was invited to many uh, important meetings. And we also had uh, experience with experience in talking with policymakers, uh, especially the minister and the uh, Parliamentary Secretary of uh, Science and Technology in Japan. And currently they are trying to change policy to support young scientists in Japan. And we are invited to meeting and we talk and we uh, like we build how we live as a young scientist in Japan. And the cabinet office announced the whole package to support young scientists in January 23rd this year. The, this policy included uh, what we talked about. So it was really good to see our voices that reached to the policymakers and they changed the policy according to what we said. And this is Global Young Academy and other members can also talk about GYS. I don't go too far. But uh, um, now if you become a new member, I became new member in 2018, there is a science leadership program at GY. And there are many kinds of uh, leadership program in many countries, but I truly recommend this leadership program, science leadership program provided by GYA because it's very active and it's very inclusive and the members are so diverse and we discussed uh, from different perspectives it was very good experience um, at India uh, Science Leadership Program at GYA. And I want to introduce a bit, little bit about this SLP. Uh, we learned collective leadership from the uh, uh, workshop. Uh, there are six domains, inquire, this means gather multiple perspective, uh, connect, uh, this means understand context and networks and engage inspire ongoing action, and strategize, develop credible and relevant solutions, 
empower, create alignment and goals and directions, assess, uh, reflect, assess challenges and strengths. So, um, so if when you take this course, you have many chances to think and discuss what your strengths are and what other strengths are and how we can develop uh, strengths together. And uh, from my uh, perspective, I am kind of strong with uh, engage, connect, and inquire, inquire and empower and in some extent, but uh, I'm not really strong with strategize and reflect. So I need somebody who can help with that aspect, then we can be a great leader. So this means that you don't have to be perfect in every domain, you can be strong, strong with some domains, but you can be a bit uh, weak at some extent, and you can uh, have other people who can cover uh, your weakness so that we can work together and be leaders together. And I was asked to provide from Japanese perspective, so I brought uh, some uh, content from a book written by Japanese people about the journey of leadership. I really like this part, so I want to read this part for you. The people around me will be happy to help those who have a genuine passion and who seriously talk about their dreams and ambitions to realize something. In a relationship, uh, in our leadership journey, we are helped by supported by others. We are not making the most of them. They are making the most of us. And we should believe that by doing so, we can do the best. While self-interest and altering become merged and for myself becomes for others and for others becomes for myself. The leader sublimates his dreams into everyone's dream. Yeah, this is, I think, uh, kind of a Japanese uh, kind of leadership. So you are a leader, you are very uh, passionate and genuine. And uh, at the same time, you can be very considerate for others. And you can merge what others want in, for the society. Then you can be a real leader. Um, I guess uh, in the uh, old kind of leadership, we imagine the strong one leader can push everything through and you can uh, get a lot of followers to one leader, but it's not like that. Now we want to push collective leadership and from Japanese perspective, not only one person being leader, everyone can be a leader and you can uh, think of others so that you can be real leader. I hope you kind of uh, get what I, I wanted to say. And now from these experiences, my leadership uh, is, to, is how you connect with others and inspire them. Guide others with passion, enthusiasm, and joy. And create a foundation system for others to clearly see a way. That is uh, currently, uh, I think, uh, my leadership is. And, and uh, I also, uh, as I said, I need someone who can strategize, give different perspective, and ask questions to me. And I, I truly, truly believe I, I can learn leadership by experiences. Uh, by reading books, you can get some ideas, but uh, in, if you don't ever experience leadership, you cannot really act as a leader. So it's really important to have, to have experiences so that you can really be a leader. And this is the, uh, uh, when I talk in the uh, International uh, Day of Women, Girls in Science. It was uh, held in the United Nations headquarters in New York. It was in February this year, so just before the uh, corona outbreak in the US. So I, I made it this year, but uh, uh, it was if it were like March, I wouldn't be able to go. So I was really lucky that I made it to the United Nations 
and there are many high school and university girls and women listening to my speech. And later, some of the, the girls talked to me and said my speech really inspired them. They want to be a scientist or a leader like myself. I felt very humble, but at the same time, I felt that uh, it is really the meaning of leadership, inspiring others and inspiring youngers so that they can also be a leader. So, and this is the, uh, my take home message. Uh, when you have something to say for your, your, for your mission or for your colleagues, you need to repeat and talk in different places until someone understands the importance and supports you. Don't give up when only a few people did not care uh, or understand you. You may create a group like National Young Academy or Global Young Academy so that you can find similar minded people around you and move forward. That is uh, what I wanted to say. And there is a famous African proverb, uh, as I showed in the uh, upside. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So I hope you are also inspired, inspired by me and we can work together uh, to, go, to go fast. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Uh, Yoko. That was a, truly an inspiring talk. And you truly uphold the leadership, uh, the science leadership while holding to the ground all the time. And that to in an area which is definitely, you know, to the core of human race, I would say, giving birth, you know, uh, improving the experiences of a lady giving birth to a new life, actually. So that's truly, truly amazing. Uh, me being a female can... Uh, talk, but I have nothing else but appreciation for your work. And you are able to do this in a fashion that you could influence the uh, guidelines and policies of big bodies like WHO, the UN, and that to uh, like uh, giving a report of your work to the PM that definitely translates into policy changes. So that's the real crux of uh, good research as well as the leadership. And you are a perfect amalgamation of both of these components. I, I have just no words beyond that. <laughs> I, I truly loved your talk and got inspired. I may get in touch with you later also. <laughs> Thank I think you. We can go for some questions. Yeah. Yeah, let's stop my video. So like in one of the slides you said about your experience uh, uh, of uh, the uh, new uh, moms while like in the process of delivery uh, nurses, they are not responding, you know, very nicely and all. Uh, so I hear this all the time. Uh, uh, I mean, I need to be honest. In India too, things are not different. And... Uh, uh, and something really needs to be done in this direction and you can make us aware as to where we are. <laughs> uh, one of the questions uh, that is again touching the same grounds is uh, by Ronit J. how widely do the public health and healthcare system vary in the developing and the developed countries? So how, uh, have you seen any difference uh, in the capacity of the uh, nursing system in a developed and a developing country in your experience. Thank you very much. Um, so when I was uh, in, in having an internship at WHO, I traveled to Sri Lanka and Timor Leste, I told uh, in the talk, and I kind of uh, got very surprised that the system was not there. There are many good nurses and good doctors and good midwives, but we really need a strong system or legislation or regulation uh, for them to work properly and get reimbursement for what they uh, use the time for. Um, so like, for example, the, it, many, many countries uh, that doesn't have a national licensure exam, so uh, in some cases, it's difficult to measure the quality of 
or knowledge of nurses uh, because they don't have exam. And also, um, what else? There are like, uh, not regulation uh, for nursing schools. So anybody who wants to build a nursing school, they can build the school. And the quality also, again, uh, could be questionable. So it's really important for the country to have a system and regulation so that the quality can be uh, like stable in among, uh, among like cities or uh, countries. So for that, I think uh, WHO and uh, there is also nursing and midwifery organization like ICN and ICM we called, uh, and they work together. We also nurses are uh, also member of a association. We can also contribute to international organization and we can uh, make a strong system in every country. So we are on the process, but uh, in some cases, uh, still not uh, there yet. So uh, ma'am, as a follow-up, what was your experience in Indian context? That would be nice to know. In fact, in India, I was uh, working in WHO office. It's quite nice. And in the New Delhi, it's uh, one of the very developed city in India. So I didn't uh, feel a uh, very uh, like developing country context in India. But uh, uh, I really enjoyed in many extent. Uh, for example, when I took a taxi, it's, a, it's like a tuk-tuk taxi. I forgot what to say in Indian language. But uh, when I talk, they don't understand English, uh, but uh, they brought me to the place um, but they, they, sometimes it, it was not what I wanted to go. <laughs> so that was like a kind of a, a difficult communication and uh, not a very a strong uh, system to go here and there, but kind of enjoyable. Uh, some driver uh, buy me some like chai and it was very nice that the driver stopped the car and uh, gave me a chai. <laughs> So I truly uh, enjoyed and I really loved living in India uh, and I enjoyed the culture and the food and everything. Oh, that's great. Okay, so I think you were referring to something called auto rickshaw or rickshaw, uh, you know, the tuk-tuk which you referred. So it's uh, something ah, called auto rickshaw, rickshaw here. Rickshaw. Yeah, and yeah. now the rickshaw is also very interesting because there is a connection with Japanese, you know, it's a Japanese mm -hmm. word, basically it's a rikisha. So it is uh, not many people are aware of this term. So I was listening to your conversation and presentation. It was really wonderful. Shimpuku song. So uh, you know, and uh, oh, yeah. so I'm just telling her that my mother was also a nurse. And uh, yes, nursing profession is uh, one of the very crucial, but the research in nursing doesn't really happen elsewhere. So, you know, except in developed countries. So I'm not really sure that it's not really fully integrated into the academies. For example, in, in NIAS, we, don't, we really don't have anyone representing the nursing field, but we do have a doctor. Uh, and yes, so that, that actually, that bias is really, we really have to uh, see that, you know? And also you said a lot of things about the Japanese Young Academy. And I'm really uh, noticed a very good trend in Japanese Academy is that it is not only for sciences, it's more integrative. Uh, you know, you mm -hmm. have uh, people from uh, philosophy, for example, uh, sociology, mm -hmm. humanities. I think that integrative approach is extremely important, especially in GYA as well. Uh, you are following that one. So many science academies, are only science academy, you know, only constrained to the sciences. So we really have to relook really into those matters as well. So having my experience in Japanese uh, culture uh, really taught me two things. If you ask me, if anybody asks me, punctuality and perseverance. So these two are really great asset of the Japanese culture. And in your slides, I saw Shalini, the earlier speaker in the Global Young Academy meetings. I could see her, you know, some of your, uh, you know, the, the photos. And uh, you also said about the science leadership program. And I was fortunate to attend the last GYA science leadership program at uh, Budapest in Hungary, mm -hmm. uh, where mm -hmm. me and uh, Dr. Gitanjali went together. So Gitanjali is our mm -hmm. next speaker. All right, so mm -hmm. these are the connections I was just telling you. And coming mm -hmm. to the question. So we have uh, one question from Kirti Sharma. Uh, Kirti Sharma is asking about Nenko Joretsu. 
Uh, mm. So uh, she heard that Nenko Joretsu, a strong emphasis on interpersonal communication, group participation, decision making. Uh, did it help? Uh, I read about this Nenko Joretsu. Can you speak a, a bit about Nenko Joretsu? <laughs> Uh, it's uh, interesting. Uh, many of you know Japanese language. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I only remember Daniel Bart. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Nenko, uh, hi, Daniel Bart. And I only know uh, that I can tell the Nenko Joritsu is like a, a age based hierarchy that uh, uh, if you are older, you are uh, in a higher position. Um, in Japanese, like young generation, uh, uh, well, in the young generation, we don't really feel that it's very, uh, I, I don't know how to say, um, effective in some cases. Uh, we need to have a young people, uh, uh, some very brilliant young people are there so that we can also uh, have a higher position if they are brilliant. It's not only the age, but also many other characteristics that can ask this person to be a leader. So uh, in my case also, I, I'm still considered as a young, but I became a professor this year. Um, so in some universities, I realized that uh, it's important to have young leaders so that uh, it's become diverse. If you have only uh, senior people, uh, it's kind of a, a homogenized, but we need to have diverse perspectives so that university can be very, um, how do I say, sustainable. And also we are kind of closer to students so we can kind of uh, uh, how do I say reply to what they want teachers to be so uh, I know some in some cases Nenko Joret works uh, but uh, in my case I want uh, young people to be a leader as well mm. So as an extension of what Dr. Felix told about the integrative approach in the Japanese, you know, academia, uh, taking uh, different like, uh, you know, nursing and all getting into research. So as per your experience, Dr. Yoko, what do you say, how, how what percentage of, uh, you know, uh, the nursing uh, people uh, uh, building up their career in nursing, they go for the research, the PhD part? Thank you very much. I think uh, the Western countries, they started a PhD program in nursing first. Uh, in Japan, they, it started in 1980s. So it's not too long ago, nursing became a discipline and we started research. But uh, nowadays, uh, many nurses want to become a uh, uh, PhD holders uh, because we are like government expanding so many nursing university in Japan. So we need more PhD holders to become a professor because there are more universities yeah. being built. Yeah. Uh, and because the reason why is that uh, is that we are very super age society now. So we need nurses to be smart and uh, do research so that uh, the elderly, can, the elder people can be uh, like have more evidence and nursing has more evidence to support those uh, people who are need care. So and now that nowadays because of the super aging society, uh, it's not only like um, uh, infectious disease or emergency kind of a condition. People have chronic disease. People need to live with chronic condition. Then we need nurses. We as nurses we provide advice health. Uh, education uh, for them to live with conditions. Uh, so that's why uh, in the current stage of uh, Japan, we need more nurses to have a PhD and do research. Yeah, that's great. That's, I think that really made you translate things from a smaller to bigger level. It's very important. Okay. So there's a question related to your PhD time, like how you navigated uh, uh, towards and made your way through the hospital administration to be able to interview the mm. uh, the new moms in the Tanzania hospital setting. 
So was the administration cooperative to you? Was it easy for you or it was something tabooed? It's a question um, from Daphne Bitalo. I think that's a good question. Um, in fact, I went to a hospital. It was built by a Norwegian missionary. So many Western researchers and Western uh, healthcare providers come uh, to the institution to do research and to do a practice and volunteer. So that is a kind of special kind of institution that allows foreign people to uh, do things. So it was easy. There was a system to do it in, within the institution. That's why I was allowed to get permissions to do it. And also I got the uh, ethical clearance as well in both in Tanzania and the United States uh, so that they, we can conduct research in Tanzania. So do any of the people in your uh, contact, they are pursuing their research stuff in India as some exchange program or something like that? That would be great to add on. No, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I became a professor this year. Temperature and is now asking. I can, can receive. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I got a call outside. in between. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so ma'am. here. Sorry. Uh, here is a question from Tamil Selvi from Coimbatore asking excellent presentation, madam. Uh, could you please explain something about Kaizen, the, the you know, Kaizen mm -hmm. as the, the continuous improvement? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this concept become popular because of Toyota. Uh, Toyota became a big uh, car production company uh, in the world. And Kaizen, this means improvement. Uh, and we kind of, uh, uh, we on the ground and uh, make a little bit of improvement every day. This is kind of a concept. And now I think uh, JICA also promote JICA is a Japan International Cooperation Agency. We have many projects in, in the developing countries and we promote five A's Kaizen. And uh, I, I hope I remember five A's is like, uh, in, uh, I know only Japanese, they don't say. <laughs> it, this, is, this means kind of a, a clean your room or uh, sort everything in order and put stuff as it's supposed to be. It's kind of very basic regular uh, uh, like organization of yourself. Um, like for example, if you have file, you need to have order and you need to know where the, uh, your document is in your office. And if you skip and you just accumulate what, your papers, you cannot find your paper when you need. But if you sort everything in order every day, uh, if when you need, you can just get it immediate. And this is also good for others as well. And if you only know where uh, the thing is, you can already get, but if you are gone, nobody knows where it is. But if you sorted everything so neat, everyone can find the paper that they need. So that is kind of a concept that uh, if you sort everything regular basis in a very basic uh, level, uh, you can be more productive. You don't waste your time for finding stuff and other people can find things very quickly. Then you, your team can be very productive. That is the meaning of Kaizen. Yes, Dr. Felix, you can go for another one. Okay, so I will pick up another question here. The question is from, let me pick up this. Uh, yes, uh, well, this is really on the leadership. Uh, her question is more on medical side. Dr. Sonia Mukherjee is asking, there are incidences of cesarean section. The C-section rates are alarmingly high everywhere. And what is the solution? And is this a trend the same in Japan as well? That is the question. Um, that's also another good question. Cesarean section, this means uh, the woman get operation to deliver babies and uh, uh, so in many countries like developing country, um, there are different variation. There is no C-section available kind of pleurocyte or 
uh, even in developing countries, uh, some people prefer uh, C-section and their rates become too high. And like develop that, I think tendency of developed country, we increase the rate little by little, uh, because I think now medicalization of birth is very uh, trend in developed country. For example, women use uh, epidural like anesthesia to give birth or other intervention. Then if you get one intervention, your chance to get another intervention become higher, including C-section. So if you started having anesthesia, uh, your chance to get C-section can be higher. Then uh, in developed country, including Japan, more women uh, wants to have this kind of uh, anesthesia for delivery. Um, their chance to get C-section become higher. That is what's happening in developed country. But in developing country, they are kind of a comp complex. Uh, I, there are many reasons that uh, can increase the rate of cesarean section. For example, it's kind of a religion, or it's kind of a financial incentives that are, are, uh, that are kind of a, not really motivated, but uh, if you a, a provide C-section and you get more money, uh, your chance to get like kind of a motivation could be higher. Uh, so th there are many uh, reasons behind that the cesarean section rate become very high. But uh, WHO also said, uh, if you have too much uh, cesarean section, that is not desirable. And they also published a statement and around 10 to 15% could be uh, the best. So currently, I think Japan is like 20 to 30%. So it's become more than what it's supposed to be according to WHO. Yes, Dr. Manchu. Yeah, so there's a question from uh, Ritvibrata Malik. Uh, so it's uh, going full circle, actually. Uh, like uh, 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 out of your work and research experience, you could influence the policy makers. And in your experience, do the changes in policy actually reflect at the ground level? Do they change the work scenario in real sense? Or it just re remains on paper? That's what the question is all about. I think uh, it's also um, fortune or luck you need. Sometimes you're really passionate about something you want to change, but things doesn't move as you wish uh, the things to be. But uh, uh, in my case, I, I'm kind of very lucky that I want to do like improvement of childbirth in developing countries. And not only me, but also many researchers do the similar kind of research. That's why systematic review can be conducted and we can influence policymakers. So uh, if you are the only one, it's kind of difficult to provide strong voice to make a policy change. So I, uh, it's really important to to also influence others so that others can also uh, follow the research uh, that you have done. And also um, kind of you also needs to learn about society. Uh, what's the tendency, what's the trend of the society so that your topic can also fit to what the trend of the uh, out of the world, then uh, your chance to get this uh, luck to make policy change could be higher. For example, in Japan, uh, because of the policy, young scientists have been struggling for many years about not having stable position, uh, not having enough funding. And this kind of struggle uh, made young scientists uh, not be very productive and our uh, like publication and everything become lower, then the government become uh, to be supportive of young scientists because the situation become very worse compared to long time ago where we are uh, winning Nobel Prize uh, for many uh, uh, research. So now we are also uh, trying to improve our society uh, of science so that we can be like better like what we have uh, the good condition before. So you really need to learn about society, then you can uh, contribute to social uh, policy change from your perspective. 
to uh, okay, so, as a yeah, yeah please go ahead uh, okay here is a question from ahim shular from upsala in sweden excellent mm -hmm. presentation professor shimpuko japanese method of ikigai is very popular here in sweden to find purpose in life can you explain a bit about it thank you very much and uh, i think uh, i mentioned the mission for research uh um, to improve the quality of care for all mothers. That is my ikigai in my sense. Ikigai is like um, how you feel happiness from what you done. So, so my, in my case, my research is my happiness and my uh, mission for life. So uh, if you find a research topic that can be ikigai, then I think uh, you can be very passionate for your career and you can be successful. Uh -huh. So it's important to have ikigai. That's great. So uh, there's a question from Manjula, like you, you are talking of uh, getting the policies changed such that the uh, not so pleasant experiences get transformed into the positive birthing experiences. So at the ground level, how the behavioral pattern, it's all human interaction that will make things better. How at the ground level things are getting modulated? Can you just explain mm -hmm. like how it is uh, percolating from the policy making up till the, say uh, the person actually doing the nursing duties? Mm -hmm. mm, okay, so in my experience about uh, young scientist policy, uh, what I have done, what uh, our team has done is the, uh, building trust uh, with policymakers. So sometimes they ask us about uh, many other things and we would volunteer, we use time, you use time to, to help policymakers, then our trust uh, started to build. Then when the things that we care uh, become kind of a trend, they also ask us to provide comment or provide input for policy uh, making. So it's important that uh, uh, you don't wait until the uh, like, you are the, the matter is only uh, for your uh, interest, uh, even though the things are not a uh, direct in interest of you, you can also try to volunteer or contribute to policymakers so that in the future, uh, when they need uh, some uh, advice from your uh, interest, you can also give advice to them. Is, that is my uh, advice uh, as a young scientist to contribute to the policymakers. Yes. We have a question from Dr. Ramesh from Singapore. What makes Japan back so many Nobel Prize winners here in South Korea or in uh, 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 here? His question is from the Singapore. Here in Singapore, we have zero laureates need back in India since independence. Japan is the only Asian country with more than five Nobel, and as of now, there are 48 Nobel Prize winners in Japan. And why, why, what makes Japan so special? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it is from my perspective, and uh, I haven't—I I guess I haven't even born <laughs> when the uh, research of a uh, Nobel Prize-winning research has been conducted. So uh, it is only my uh, perspective, but uh, I can say that it's important to have a freedom for research. You can start your research with your curiosity, uh, then you have. Uh, uh, time and you have enough funding. That's the three things that are most important for successful research and you can break through and you can get Nobel Prize. But now, uh, I think for many young researchers, you have struggled with a stable uh, position that makes uh, your time very limited and uh, not enough funding. And uh, uh, sometimes policymakers give the research topic for you to do. It's not your curiosity or interest, but you have to do it because it's your job. Those kind of situation, it's really difficult to get breakthrough and get a very, uh, a big finding like Nobel Prize. So these three things, time, funding, and uh, uh, curiosity-driven research, that is the uh, most important aspect for success. 
So there's a question from uh, Hari Tejas S. Ayer. It's about the GYA actually, but I think I would just extend his question further to add on to your mission as to how you are using this GYA platform to enhance or you know taking your mission further. What are your experience? How it has taken you one step ahead or many steps ahead, I would say. Thank you very much. I guess uh, because of my GYA executive committee uh, membership, I was invited to many uh, important meetings, including this UN uh, uh, International Day of Science, uh, Women and Girls in Science. Uh, that kind of thing never happened in my life uh, until I become a GYA member. And uh, so now I became a little bit more uh, globally known and I can get more opportunities because of that. Um, before GYA, I, I'm focusing on my research. I'm doing research. I'm happy about that. But my uh, like goal to become an uh, like influencer to make uh, to change policy for childbirth for women, I need to step further to be a stronger leader uh, in global context. So for my uh, uh, future goal. It's important to have this step, uh, then I can improve the quality of care for women uh, in many places. So that is my uh, uh, experience as GYA. That's yes. uh, Professor Shinkuku, I think the time is already up, but if you have time, then we can put up the last two. Is it okay for you? Yeah, yes, so enough. then I, let me uh, pick up one question. Yes, one question uh, is that what is the difference between collective leadership and the normal leadership? The question asked by Anjana Svija. Anjana Svija. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think uh, in many cases, even in Japan, many people believe good leadership is like one person, very strong, uh, guide everyone by herself or himself that has been considered as a leadership. Uh, but uh, now collective leadership indicates you are not alone. You can be a strong uh, leader in some extent, but in some uh, other like, attributes you don't have. You can ask other people to join and contribute. And that is collecting other people and make a team to make a dream come true. So uh, that is the difference between like uh, old style leadership and collective leadership. So there's an important question. I think we should, if, if the time allows, maybe a few seconds. Mm -hmm. So it talks of the uh, postpartum depression. Is mm -hmm. it really talked about in developing countries per se? Or uh, it doesn't exist in terms of you know, hospital care? Mm, I guess uh, it's not have been investigated by far because in many cases in Japan, uh, women stayed in the hospital for five days and followed up uh, sometimes two weeks or one month and we can find uh, mothers who are depressed. But uh, we also regularly use like uh, EPDS, it's a Edinburgh postpartum depression scale for all the mother that we can screen uh, if they are risky or they, if they have high scores, we can uh, address those women. Uh, but uh, in many cases in developing country, uh, after you give birth, like within 24 hours, you are out of the hospital and not followed up uh, if you are not if you don't go to the hospital again. So there is a not a lack of a system to follow up women. That's why postpartum depression haven't been found by far. But we need to investigate uh, so that we can see if there are no cases or if there are cases, but we don't know yet. With this, we, uh, we conclude the session and uh, really very uh, enlightening session. And uh, the moms, the new moms and the dads too, definitely they must be feeling uh, there are people who are working uh, tirelessly towards this noble cause of making things better for one of the, uh, you know, uh, 
priceless experience a lady has in in her life thank you so much we really uh, um, thank you from the bottom of our heart uh, the organizer can take up further things yes yes dr felix can add up? yes thank you so much dr manju as well as uh, professor shimpuku we are really delighted to have you here how many arigato gozaimashita it was really wonderful presentation and uh, it was really nice to have you uh, with us uh, you have uh, you know spent considerable amount of time with us and we have actually overshot by few minutes it's basically 4 minutes and uh, yeah my best wishes for you and your presentation opened up the vast vistas of the medical research uh, actually and the importance of uh, you know the importance of actually uh, uh, fostering the research in midwifery and nursing as well so some of the field that we are totally avoiding here in india so uh, none of the researchers are basically from the the nursing field so that that tendency we really have to see that you know what is actually going on we we need to establish some national institute for the nursing and uh, probably it is there but uh, you know somehow it is not in the mainstream so i think uh, your presentation is really an eye opener and uh, yes so you did a very good job thank you so much and on behalf of the central university of punjab and all the other organizers and have a good day so thank you coming next much. is so let me share my screen once again uh, our next talk is by dr geetanjali yadav and uh, this talk is from 5:30 pm to 6:30 pm dr geetanjali is uh, a faculty from university of cambridge uh, uk and she is also a member of inyas so stay tuned and till then goodbye and enjoy a cup of coffee or tea goodbye thank you bad thank you bad